Hello my soccer universe. Well, it's time for another book review. I just realized I'm wearing probably for the first time on this channel this uh, blue 2002 Brazil away jersey but it doesn't seem right because I have only club jersey on the background but hey so be it. There's a good reason I'm wearing this one because of one excerpt I'm gonna read out of this book which I think is a um, general book about soccer and the impact of soccer on a society is probably the classic. It's called Soccer Against the Enemy by Simon Cooper. Simon Cooper is one of the one of my favorite writers, um, soccer writers. He has written my favorite book. It's not this one, although this one is a close one. I would put this probably I put this in my top three. It's for sure in my top five soccer books um, in there. It's more or less a travelogue. I mean, let's say it's called Soccer Against the Enemy, how the world's most popular sport starts and fuels revolutions and keeps dictators in power. The cool thing about this is it was written in the early 90s, uh, which is kind of the, a, a time that I I remember these times in Europe and uh, this guy, Simon Cooper, I think he was born, if I'm not totally mistaken, he was born in Africa, uh, lived a long time in Amsterdam, now he's living in Paris, but he's of British descent, something like that. Um, very multinational uh, personality, don't, don't quote, quote, quote me that one. And he basically, I think he does this as a 20 year old, he travels all over the world in the search for uh, what soccer does to different countries. And if you just read the headlines of each chapter, it gives you an idea. I mean, at first is a chasing soccer around the wo world and soccer is war. The soccer dissident, the Baltics want to be in America. The secret police chief, rules of Ukraine, the lone skinhead saves nation, Gaza, Europe and the fall of Margaret Thatcher, a David Elenio Herrera, a very interesting chapter because Elenio Herrera is the one who is always credited with inventing Catenaccio, FC Barcelona, the Scottish question, Dutch and English by Bobby Robson failed in Holland, Africa in belief, Roger Miller and President Beer, so he's going to Africa, Mandela at Helderfontein, Chart, Dark Americans, Argentina, Campeon, Pelé de Malandro, Celtic and Rangers, or Rangers and Celtic, from Boston to Bangladesh at the 94 World Cup, the President and the Bad Blue Boys, and Global Game, Global Jihad, which was an added um, chapter for uh, this new version. It is an engrossing read. Um, if you like, it's both travel report uh, as well as kind of uh, giving you background on soccer it is not uh, it kind of paints a big picture with little stories this this is a reissue that i bought in america in the late 2000s so maybe this was the 15 years or, or whatever okay. but definitely a really great book uh what i like best is if you look at the soccer ball here on the top that Bulgaria of all nations is in the center. There's Mexico, Iran. Uh, you know, it's all not so great soccer nations in there, which I find also very interesting, but gives you the flavor of the book. He's not necessarily, although we have Barcelona and others in there, he's not necessarily going to uh, the big leagues. It's around the world, all over, all over the world. I want to read you two sections from this book. Um, one, a little bit of a darker one, but one that actually, if you ask me about this book, this is one of the sections that always stays with me because it kind of hits close to home. It's very close to home. And then another one, which is a little bit more positive and it's about uh, why I'm wearing this Brazil jersey for this um, book recommendation. I'm going to uh, say uh, through the beginning of chapter 7, Lone Skinhead Saves Nation. I took a train from Prague, passed through Bratislava again uh, at 3 in the morning and arrived in Budapest a couple of hours later to find soccer on the front pages of all the newspapers. A shame they were in Hungarian. Hungarian, one of those, um, I think, three languages in Europe 
that are not related to the other big three. The big three, of course, are the Germanic languages, the Romance languages and the Slavic lang languages, but Hungarian, Turkish and Finnish, they are kind of their own entity in a way. Uh, 12 days before, Ferenc Varos of Hungary had visited Slovan Bratislav of Slovakia to play a European Cup match and 15 Hungarian fans had landed up in the hospital. Soccer hooliganism had nothing to do with it. I was in Budapest for the return match and revenge was in the air. Ferenc Varos versus Slovan looked like it was turning into something more than a soccer game. And you would not, to be honest, if you have no idea, you would not think that this is a big ri rivalry. Yes, ne ne neighboring nations all, part have, all have been part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but there is the root for the problem. In Bratislava, Slovak anti-terrorist troops in black masks had repeatedly stormed Ferenc Varos fans who may or may not have been chanting Greater Hungary or Give us Southern Slovakia back. The troops had used tear gas and wooden clubs and had been thorough. The Slovak crowd had applauded. Tibor Nilashi, Hungarian legend of the past and now manager of Ferenc Varos, had thought of the Heisel. And he told Korea, I'm not afraid to say that it reminded me of the cruelties of the fascists. At the final whistle, Slovan had thanked the troops over the loudspeakers. A peculiar and repulsive act, said the Hungarian consul. And then police had chased Hungarians in the streets around the stadium while Slovak fans stoned Hungarian cars and buses. Slovan won the match 4-1. This is not a soccer roar, it is a political question, said uh, Gula Horn, the Hungarian elder statesman. Within three months, Czechoslovakia was to split into Czech Republic and Slovakia, and Bratislava, scene of the beatings, was to become the Slovak capital. Independent Slovakia under President Major showed signs of becoming a nasty little nationalist uh, state. Major, often seen at Slovak matches, liked to say that Slovakia had been truly free only as a puppet state of Nazi Germany during World War II. He blamed all problems on enemies at home and abroad. I wonder who is playing the dirty game at our expense, he asked when books were found in the American embassy in Bratislava. The 600,000 Hungarians who live in Slovakia were frightened. Major was already complaining about bilingual road signs in, Hung in Hungarian areas and they feared that worse was to follow. No more Hungarian schools, a ban on the language and one day perhaps even ethnic cleansing. Yugoslavia, after all, was just down the road. The Hungarian diaspora is the largest in Europe. It spreads across Romania, Slovakia and the Ukraine and politicians in Budapest fret over it. The year before, Hungarians in Romania had been killed in a pogrom. When Slovak troops beat Hungarian soccer fans, Budapest protested immediately, but Major retorted that the fans were hooligan who had got what they deserve. I want to leave it at that. Just a little taste of something kind of sour happening, but interesting. Now to the little bit brighter one. Uh, this is about chapter 70, Pelé de Malandro. That's why I'm wearing a Brazil jersey. Probably should have worn a yellow one, but you know, I want to give this one some love. Uh, Armando Nogueira, Brazil's most famous soccer writer, lives in a Panthers flat overlooking a blue lake in southern Rio. We had been talking for two hours and he had presented me with four of his books when he suddenly had a new thought. He ran out of the room to fetch a frame that contained a letter and a photograph. The photograph showed a scene from the World Cup of 1970, from the quarterfinal in Guadalajara between Brazil and England. More precisely, it showed Pelé and Bobby Moore. Pelé is tweaking Moore's shirt between two fingers, while Moore is poking his foot precisely between Pelé's legs at the ball. Both men are frowning with concentration, yet neither is so much as touching the other. The mutual courtesy is the astonishing fact. Moore had died of cancer while I was in Argentina, and he had been given a long obituaries in the South American press. The letter beside the photograph will be a Noguera family treasure until the line dies out. It is from Pelé. My brother Armando, if you describe this action with Bob Moore in your book, Ball at the Cristal, you could say that we were being too courteous for a World Cup game, but that is sport. Your friend, play. This sums up Brazilian soccer. Instead of noting that Brazil beat England and went on to win the World Cup, Pelé merely remarks on the beauty of an irrelevant incident. Consider also his reaction to Banks' legendary save in the, uh, in the same match. At that moment, I hated Gordon Banks more than any man in soccer. But when I cooled down, I had to applaud him with my heart. When we think of Brazil, we think of Pelé's team. This Brazil first appeared in 1958 at the World Cup in Sweden when Pelé was 17. Brazil beat the host nation in 5-2 in the final, during which Brazilian fans chanted Samba, Samba, and after which the team ran a lap of honor, first with their own flag, then with the flag of Sweden. 
that Brazil won the World Cup again in 62, lost it in 66 when Pelé was kicked out of the tournament and won it again in 1970. The Brazilian style fleetingly reappeared in 1982, but nowadays it is likely to be found in Dutch or French colors as in the yellow and blue. As Brazil, it barely exists anymore. I was in Rio to find out why the Brazilians used to play the way and why they no longer do. Rio de Janeiro is really two cities, the one Johannesburg, the other Soweto, meaning the rich town and then the poor suburbs. The rich light-skinned people live along the beachfronts and the poor dark-skinned ones in the favelas on the mountains. The favelas are painted in pastel shades and look like pretty summer houses from below, which is the angle from which the rich always see them. The rich never, never go up the mountains. The murder rate in the favelas is high and the favela dwellers can sniff a rich man a mile away. The air-conditioned metro does not venture there and there is no running water, no lighting or no beaches nor anything else. In the great days of Brazilian soccer, the favelas were the home of the malandro. We feel when we see Brazil play that the Brazilian style comes natural to Brazilian people. The Brazilians think so too. When you ask them to play at them to explain, they talk about the malandro. The malandro is a figure from Brazilian folklore. His ancestors were slaves. Brazil has abolished slavery as late as 1888, and he is resolved to be completely free. He thinks discipline is a good thing for the mediocre, but not for the malandro. He's a con man, a trickster. He works alone and obeys no rules. Though poor, he manages to dress well, to eat in the best places, and to charm beautiful women. The point is that Brazilians see themselves as malandros. He stands for national character. Or at least, he did. I'm gonna leave you there. Again, this is Soccer Against the Enemy. This is an absolute classic in soccer literature. One that you should read, although it is now almost 30 years old, probably more 25 or so on, really read this book. You will not be this disappointed. It is in its description kind of timeless, although some events have passed, but certain things are still popping up. Highly, highly recommended. Hope you will enjoy this book too. If you have read it, let me know what you think about it. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like these. And I will talk to you soon. Bye. Hey there. I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you might enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel as it will keep you updated on all the things that are rotating in my soccer universe. And with that, I wish you a wonderful day. Bye.